Thanks, Mary, and hi, everybody. Um, this is a really tall um, podium for somebody who's only 5'2". <laughs> um, okay, Julia. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to the uh, final session. It's always uh, nerve-wracking being the last people, but we hope that you enjoy this presentation. I'm Julia um, Avenal. I'm the learning designer at the Australian Film TV Radio School. Yeah, and I'm Jane Newton. I'm the head of curriculum at Afters. Is that better? Oh, that's better. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so we're from the Australian Film TV and Radio School. Um, and we're talking today about advanced grading, creating efficiencies with Moodle rubrics. Um, I just wanted to um, start the presentation with a, a quote that um, I heard on the Moodle podcast the other day from Abby Fry that she said, Moodle is a journey of utilising the features better and better. And that really resonated with me because um, I think that it's not just about um, making iterative changes to the learning content, it's also about making iterative changes to your workflow um, and um, finding efficiencies um, in that workflow. So this presentation is about some of the efficiencies that we have made in our workplace using the Moodle um, online rubric um, tool. And um, I think basically we all want to spend less time marking and more time teaching, so this may be something that could help you as well. So who are we? So AFTERS was established in 1973 um, under an Act of Parliament. Uh, so we're turning 50 next year. Um, and our campus is based in Sydney, Australia. Uh, our purpose is to support the next generation of Australian storytellers through teaching all facets of film production and broadcast. Um, and so that includes writing, directing, producing, cinematography, editing, design and sound. So effectively, I mean, we, we have a range of award courses, both undergrad and postgraduate courses, and we also have a suite of short um, and industry certificate courses as well. Um, effectively, we're, we're practice-based education. I mean, you know, you kind of need to be there making things um, in order to kind of teach the content that we do. Um, but uh, we, we use Moodle uh, to support our learning. So what is a rubric? A rubric is typically an evaluation tool. It's to measure attainment against a consistent set of criteria. Rubrics are really useful in helping to position students against a set of learning standards, and it helps to determine how well they've met certain learning outcomes. It's a really transparent tool. So why do we use Moodle rubrics? AFTERS uses rubrics as our primary assessment tool. Um, we also use some observation checklists and things as well, but we, we do tend to rely quite heavily on, on rubrics as our, as our assessment instruments. A big part of the reason for doing this um, is it, it helps us to mark really efficiently and consistently across large cohorts and with multiple markers. So um, in the case of our Bachelor of Arts um, screen production course, we have 90 students each year. So that's a lot of students to mark um, and we have multiple markers um, working you know, with their cohorts across the year group. So it helps to keep things consistent for us. So then using inbuilt Moodle rubrics with grades being calculated automatically in the back end, it means fewer errors and miscalculations by our markers, plus the grades are immediately visible to students and we don't need to upload separate marking sheets, so there's an efficiency there as well. Um, and rubrics are a useful tool for student self-evaluation. So we encourage our students to review their rubrics prior to submitting their work um, so that they can verify whether they've met all of the required criteria before they put the work in. Um, so I'd just like to talk about the nuts and bolts of how you start building a Moodle rubric for those of you who haven't ventured into the advanced grading features in the assignment. So you start, you start with the assignment activity and in, within the assignment activity you set the grading method to be rubric. From there you go to the settings and you can then go to step number two is either go to advanced grading or define rubric depending on whether you're building one from scratch whether you're adapting one that was used on that assignment before, because they will roll over when you um, copy your courses, um, or whether you're creating one um, based on a template that somebody else has um, pre-built for you. Um, step number three, once you get inside the rubric uh, page, you then build out essentially a grid um, that you can add rows and columns um, to populate with your marking criteria and the point value that is going to be assigned at each grade, um, grade band level. 
There are also a bunch of um, rubric settings at the bottom which sort of effectively um, a, a change how the students uh, are going to see the rubric and I'd say get in there and you know play with all of those and see which ones are suitable for your students and your particular course. And the finished product looks a little bit, something a little bit like this. You have your marking criteria on the left and going left from right in our organisation. Uh, we go um, HD to a fail um, and in each cell that's associated with that there's a numerical value behind that, a positive numerical value. And um, the rubric is going to calculate um, the grade based on the median of that grade band. Um, one of the things that um, I would recommend doing if um, you are rolling these out across a bunch of different courses is actually to get everybody to make all their rubrics out of 100. We have had instances where some people are doing them out of 50, some people are doing them out of 100, gets really messy. Um, I'd say if you go for 100 across the board, it really simplifies things um, at the final stages of marking. What you do find is that rubrics will calculate um, based on the median, so students in a particular grade band will always come out at the same mark. Um, that means, uh, you know, if you need to um, bump up, a, if you want to bump up a student up or down a few marks, um, you can do that manually when the grades are released. So what makes a good rubric? So not all rubrics are created equally and a poorly worded or an overly complicated rubric can make marking really challenging. Ideally, the marker shouldn't need to exercise their own subjective discretion when awarding a grade. The indicators should support the marker in selecting the appropriate grade for each student. So I suppose if you're, if you're doing a little bit of a, um, a review of your own rubrics, um, really do look at those indicators and, and, and see whether they would be easy to award or if they're sort of a little bit opaque and, and difficult to interpret. Um, so the best rubrics are those where the indicators are concise and unambiguous and each criterion should ask for a very specific and tangible input and sometimes where we've gone wrong in the past is within one indicator or one criterion we've tried to ask for too many things um, and then it makes it really hard, it makes the, the marker sort of has to, to go oh they've, they've achieved that but they haven't achieved this and so where do I put them? So I guess trying to really simplify your, your criteria and, and have those indicators really clear just really helps with that marking. And students themselves should also be able to use the rubric um, as a form of feedback. So they can see um, when, they, when they get their grade, you know, and they've seen their rubric marked up, they can sort of see um, why, you know, there's a bit of inherent feedback built into that process for them. So then if we're trying to engage students with rubrics, um, student input can really assist in the design of a good rubric, um, ensuring students understand the assessment requirements and even having them co-determine um, the rubric can be a good way to engage them. Um, it's also quite useful to provide examples of kind of rubrics in practice. So if you have some exemplar student work that you're, you should, you're showing, um, you could always have the marked rubric sitting alongside it so they can sort of see how the marking would have happened for that piece of work. Um, and uh, providing fun video explainers has been one way the after staff have helped our students to engage with the assessment tools and we're going to have just a, a look at a quick example of that now. Hello. Oh, hey Amber. Oh, oh hey. <laughs> Where am I? Welcome to the rubric explainer. Uh, we have brought you into the rubric, we're inside it, mm -hmm. to explain it to our students. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk through um, the, the last two assessments, the, uh, the mood reel and the director's statement, and we're going to go through uh, the criteria with the students, and, um, and then we'll talk through what uh, an HD looks like so that they know exactly what we're looking for. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk through it and feel free to jump in and ask me questions and, and ch uh, chime in yourself because you've got notes from um, how the students did last year as well. So, okay, cool. so I thought we would start with the director's statement. Now, only because in my brain when I'm doing this work, I start with the director's statement. Um, it doesn't mean you have to do this this way. Like you could start with the mood reel uh, first, depending on how your brain works. Um, okay, so. Director's statement, um, it's worth, you can see up the top there, worth 40% of your mark. Um, and we have four different criteria. So you've got industry forms and practice delivers a well-structured, clear and detailed vision. Um, that's, to me, that's like an overall 
thing. It's like I'm impressionistically reading the whole thing and going, this is a good director statement. This is an HD, well-structured, clear, detailed, sophisticated, is an industry standard. That's what I expect um, from someone handing this in to Screen Australia or Screen New South Wales or another state agency. Um, and I just want to say that little video was actually completely lo-fi. It was filmed during lockdown just with a digital background on a Zoom um, using the immersive mode. So, um, you know, we, we have a lot of technology at film school that we can use to make videos, but we didn't. <laughs> we just do <laughs> Zoom. <laughs> um, because we didn't have access to it. Um, we, that was literally made at home. Um, so, yeah. Um, so, I just wanted to talk now a little bit about some of the iterative changes that we've made. Um, I'm sorry uh, the text has gone a bit small there, um, but I'll just talk you through it. Um, so, many of you might relate to this um, problem in that Moodle can't easily um, deduct late penalties. Um, uh, when you're doing marking uh, in the gradebook. So we apply our late pen penalties manually um, at an assessment panel, but when we were using Moodle rubrics to grade, um, what we were finding is that the, our teaching staff weren't able to apply those late marks because they were marking on the rubric. Um, so in our workflow process, uh, what would happen is we would make those adjustments in our assessment panel um, and basically it was a matter of uh, you know, manually adjusting um, the grade um, and then typing into the second cell um, that a late penalty had been applied and noting what the original mark was so they knew what they would have got if they hadn't done, you know, handed it in late. What actually the result there was a lot of fiddly work with, you know, 70 to 100 students typing this in. Um, and quite often we made errors and um, there were inconsistencies um, and obviously it was t time consuming as well. Um, so what we came up with in the next iteration was that we would use the online rubric to actually deduct the late penalties at the point of marking. So instead of um, having uh, a positive value as assigned to each cell, we applied a negative value, a numerical value. So the criteria was the late penalty column um, and then we had a the first row the first column was zero points if they were on time we just said no late penalties applied zero points were deducted and then moving left to right if they were one day late they lost five marks um, if they were two days late they lost ten marks and so on um, obviously everybody has different um, penalties that they need to apply but that's how it works out for us as five marks a day. Um, this is a bit of a game changer actually because teachers were now, or tutors even, were able to apply these late marks instead of the lead teachers actually trying to do all this fiddly work at the assessment panel when you're meant to be concentrating on um, you know, bigger issues at hand. Um, some of the other efficiencies that we have um, sort of developed um, over time is um, we started to publish our rubrics as templates. Um, to do that, all you need to do is to uh, create your template in the first instance and then you publish it as a template. It's then available for everybody in your organisation to uh, copy or uh, copy and adapt. Um, you, I would say if you're going to start using uh, templates, agree on a naming convention. Um, once you start getting a lot of templates in there, uh, it can be quite tricky to find them, especially when you have a lot of assessments that have quite, have, have quite similar names or when people uh, don't name them at all. Um, uh, in our organisation, um, our administrative staff um, build the rubrics on behalf of the teaching staff. So to help them apply the correct numerical value within the rubric, we started out with a, a spreadsheet that was a, a pre-calculated matrix of the grade bands and the weightings that were going to be applied and the numerical value at each grade band. Um, and then we realised we could actually build a rubric template with those um, pre-calculated uh, grade band numerical values into the rubric. So now we have a fully uh, a full rubric with every numerical value for every percentage of each weight band um, and it's really just a matter of the administrative staff coming in using that base template 
de uh, deleting the rows that they're not going to use, uh, duplicating the ones that they are going to use. Um, and again, that has been a game changer because um, it's taken uh, literally days off the work that they have to do at the beginning of the September, uh, beginning of semester, um, now that they have this, uh, this template published. So just some positive feedback. So the feedback from students about the video explainer we just watched was extremely positive. Um, by using humour and a light but informative approach, students were made familiar with the rubric and the assessment requirements. Um, it was also interesting, um, a, a few students were noting that it really, um, it helped them, look, reading and interpreting the, the rubric really helped them to kind of understand how um, our teaching staff approached markings. So together with the, the video explainer, kind of it really did help them to sort of understand how they might position their work um, for a higher grade, which is kind of what we want. And then just some feedback from the staff. So um, they found that markings obviously easier and quicker and they don't have to do all of this manual calculation. Um, they can just click the buttons in the automated rubric um, to get the mark that they need. Um, and it's also easier to moderate um, across multiple markers. And as I was saying before, with the example of our bachelor course, it's such a big cohort that we've got multiple people looking at student work. So um, they found that that was, that was great. And then they were able to really um, feel like their marking was really rigorous as it should be, um, and that they could trust the tool, they could trust the rubric um, to, to give the mark that they, they feel the student deserved. Um, and I just wanted to add as well, there's a cost saving in that as well. I mean, everybody's got tight budgets at the moment and this has really enabled us to um, get people marking, you know, within the allocated time um, rather than spending too much time and, you know, coming away feeling, um, you know, exhausted and overwhelmed because they don't, they can't get the marking done in time or, you know, you have to um, find more money to pay more people to mark. That's right. And we actually do... Um, you know, as w in addition to using our, um, our automated rubrics, we also ask the tutors to, um, to provide some written feedback as well. So having a more efficient kind of rubric marking system meant that then they could spend more time on that written feedback. So that's it. Thank you. This is us. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, thank you. That, that was really interesting. Um, we do have plenty of time for questions. Uh, I was interested in your, it's not a question, just a comment, your uh, late penalty negative uh, marking row. I thought, yeah, that's a clever idea. Yeah. Um, okay, so if you have a question, uh, put your hand up and uh, uh, wait for the microphone to come to you. Hi, thank you for this very uh, um, interesting and clear presentation. Um, I have two questions actually. One is, can you have multiple graders for the same assignment, same student? Because um, we do do that sometimes at my uh, school. And I just forgot the other question, but it'll come back. <laughs> um, yeah, yes, you, uh, yes, we can if the grade hasn't been released yet. Yes, we can do that, and sometimes we do do that, especially um, you know if there might be some sort of contentious issue or. We have a new grader who isn't sure, um, especially like the, the point that Jane mentioned before where we've made the mistake of cramming too much into one assessment criteria and they don't know whereabouts on the rubric to mark, we might get two markers in or you know, if the student wants to question um, the mark. Generally we would have one person um, grading but we can have two. No, no, it'd still be the one no. overall result, but no. it's editable before you release the yeah. grade. So, so yeah. they would have to agree. Yeah. yeah, which would happen through a moderation process that we have. So again, for courses where we've got multiple markers looking at you know a lot of student work, there, there's always a moderation session that would happen um, so that they'll do that little bit of benchmarking and they might adjust um, the grade bands just depending on you know sort of you know, looking at a cross section of um, student results. Did you remember your Hi. other question? <laughs> Hi. Um, I always have an issue working with faculty coming up with what's in the criteria. And sometimes they put too much stuff in the criteria and then they can't get, they're like, oh, they can't get enough. Or I had one person that had a 38 criteria rubric that they used to grade. Um, how do you talk to faculty about what to include and what not to include? Yeah, it's, it sounds like for 38 criteria, that sounds like using a rubric's the wrong assessment tool. 
it sounds like that's more of an observation checklist or you know, some other tool, but yeah, that, that sounds like there was, you're just trying to cram too much into quite limited tool. I mean, obviously, you know, a rubric um, really should only have probably no more than four or five kind of criteria, um, and then, d you know, with the, the weighting, kind of the 100% weighting distributed across that criteria, so that it sort of calculates to 100% at the end, um, but yeah, so I, I, my advice would be to really break it down, like sort of obviously look at the subject learning outcomes first and then, and then think about how um, you might get the student to, to demonstrate those, you know, those learning outcomes um, and then do consider maybe having some, you know, complementary sort of assessment tools alongside your rubric. But yeah, always really, it is always a challenge to, to try and make sure that, the, you know, each of the criterion is really tangible and specific rather than being loaded up with lots of things. It's really tricky. <laughs> Hi, so I've got a sort of follow-up question to that. Is it realistic? From what you said, it seems quite difficult. Is it realistic? Do people get their rubrics right first time, or does it take a few kind of goes of using the rubric and then tweaking it to actually get to a rubric that really works well? Yeah, yeah, Ex yeah, exactly. So there's always that sort of continuous improvement. So you know, you, you give it a good go. You, you know, you kind of say, well, this is the rubric that we've agreed on for this task. But then through course review at the end of each, you know, year of delivery, round of delivery, we always take the time to have a look at it and go, is that working? And particularly, I mean, I guess the biggest indicators are, um, you know, is it is it easy to mark against? Like, or was that really challenging? Like I said earlier, does it need a lot of subjectivity to go, ooh, it's a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and let's try and split the difference and put it somewhere sort of, you know, around a credit sort of grade because we don't know where else to put it. Like, so I guess, yeah, we always do a, a review process each year and, and yeah, we, we have found that we've tweaked and refined those, those criteria over time. And then after a while, it's like, yeah, now that rubric's really working. <laughs> I'll tell you what it does help with though, actually, um, in terms of like a learning curve for people. We, we have a lot of industry experts who come in and teach our students and they are not teachers. Um, and, very, and quite often they're quite nervous about marking students because they have never done that before. And they may or may not even be coming back you know, the next semester, you know, they're, in, they're in and out. And um, when they get into the online rubric in Moodle and they realise that they don't have to do any maths, they don't have to sit there and um, you know mull over like where a student has landed. They really just have to select the cells and trust in the rubric. Um, it really does uh, free them up to think more about the specific feedback that they're going to give, and they can just write a couple of paragraphs. And the learning curve is uh, really minimal, and that is great because they you know they're here for a short time and a good time, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> you remember. <laughs> Second question. <laughs> um, do you usually mark up or mark down? Meaning, do you usually, um, with the criteria that you put in place, give points or deduct points for not meeting the criteria? For the automated rubrics, the, the inbuilt rubrics that we're speaking about, we um, for each grade band we take the median, so it sits right in the middle, um, with you know within each grade band, um, which means that then potentially multiple students can end up being marked the same if they're marked sort of like an HD for that criteria, um, a, a D for that one, a credit for that one. So it, it could end up calculating to the same overall grade. And then we, we will often then do a sort of a secondary moderation sort of process before we release the grades and have a look and just decide whether we want to tweak some of those grades up or down. And so we've got, and, and Julia talked to that before, there's, there's some discretion for us to override that automatically calculated total um, if we want to bump them up. Like if they're sort of sitting just, just shy of being bumped up to the next grade band, we might decide actually that piece of work was really good. It's deserving of a distinction rather than a credit. So we'll, just, we'll notch them up just manually by a couple of grades just to get them over the line. Um, so it, 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 that is a discretionary thing. Um, we tend to find, um, and again, speaking to the sort of the success of the rubric, if, you know, it, it does, a good rubric does mean that we're, we're sort of usually happy with where the student ends up sitting and, and then, then we're able to sort of go, yeah, no, that, that kind of worked. But yeah, there is always that um, element of manual override if we need to. The feedback that the students get, is mm. it you didn't do this or you did do that? Yeah, that's right. So that will come through in the written feedback. So obviously, like I say, in each of the... Um, 
uh, each of the sort of indicators in the rubric, there's a little bit of inherent feedback in there, but also then we ask them to write a little bit of written feedback as well, and it's usually just a couple of sentences, something good, something bad, something for later. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we sort of tend to, um, yeah, give them, give them that sort of guidance written. And we also, I mean, after this, because we're, we're a small school and, you know, we've, we've got, you know, fewer students than I'm sure a lot of you, um, we do a lot of mentoring, so we, we always sort of invite students to seek feedback and have a one-to-one -one with their tutor and better understand um, their grades. So yeah, there's, there's additional feedback there too. Great, thank you. You, one last question, yeah? Yep. Going, going. <laughs> Gone, okay, thank, oh, no, 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 just in time. Very last one, thank you. It's like an auction. Yeah. <laughs> um, you talked a bit about peer-to-peer -peer assessment. Uh, the rubric you've developed, uh, can they be used to, in peer-to-peer -peer assessment, or does it have to be something completely different? You can, but we, we don't. We haven't done that yet. We did talk about it actually because we did have one assessment where um, we do have a peer-to-peer -peer assessment. Actually what we ended up doing, because it was basically like a, a screening where the students had to screen their work and then they, they got an audience uh, response on their work. Um, we actually chose to use a Mentimeter uh, for that um, and then we manually put those grades into the rubric. But the students were given a copy, of, like a copy of the rubric to make their judgment about, you know, it was basically like the movies, one star to five star kind of situation. Um, but yeah, we haven't, um, we haven't done any other peer-to-peer -peer using the online rubric. Right. Thank you.